program is from NET, Educational Television Network. Everything we human beings ever do, no matter how ordinary it seems, has a complex beginning in our brains. Finding out how the brain does this work is a study that has fascinated scientists for centuries. One puzzling aspect of the study is the fact that all our activities are controlled not by one brain, but by two interconnected half-brains. Why do we have a double brain? Dr. R. W. Sperry of the California Institute of Technology is seeking the answer. Working with him on a series of unique experiments is Dr. Michael Gazzaniga. The brain, is, of course, is an enormously complex structure. In fact, it's kind of redundantly complex. We have two cerebral hemispheres, and in the body we have two kidneys, we have two lungs. We have a, this double nature uh, throughout the whole body system. Now, we know that the, the lung and the kidney can uh, 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 operate separately and independently, but it becomes a fascinating question to know whether the two cerebral hemispheres can operate separately and independently, or how dependent are they? Well, the way to get at this question would be to separate the two cerebral hemispheres by the major uh, intrahemispheric uh, connection. And we do this surgically in the cat and monkey by sectioning this structure, as can be seen in this half-brain section. It is called the corpus callosum, and it has over two million nerve fibers, and they richly interconnect the two halves of the brain. Once this is sectioned, or once we're after the question of what can each cerebral hemisphere do, we have to be able to lateralize the sensory input uh, to one or the other cerebral hemisphere. We have to make an additional surgical lesion, and it's at the point where the optic nerves come back from the eyes and cross. It's called the optic chiasm. By sectioning down the midline, the optic chiasm, we can, in effect, make it so that what the animal sees through the left eye uh, it is primarily projected to the left hemisphere, and what the animal sees through the right eye, only the right hemisphere sees. And by sectioning the optic chiasm, and in addition, the corpus callosum, as we've explained, we can begin to test the dependence and independence of uh, each cerebral hemisphere. The approach is quite simple. You make a midline incision over the top of the animal's skull, and you turn a rather large bone flap back so that you can expose the brain over the midline. The uh, dura matter is a protective covering of the brain, and it has to be cut back also in order to get right into the cerebral hemispheres. Once this is exposed, one separates the cortex with a retractor, goes down in between the cerebral hemispheres by using a suction technique. The instrument used for sectioning the corpus callosum is merely a converted hypodermic needle uh, that is hooked onto a suction pump. And with a light amount of suction, this is placed down in between the cerebral hemispheres. And it is used to suck away the corpus callosum brain tissue so as not to injure the surrounding blood vessels. Now, you also have to keep going down deeper in the brain to get at the optic chiasm, which is the part of the brain that also has to be sectioned in order to limit what the animal sees through one eye to one particular hemisphere. Once that is done, bone flap is replaced, the animal is sewn up, and within a day, he's up and hopping around and has no major problems. Well, the operation isn't nearly as traumatic as one might think it would be. There is no noticeable behavioral change. Their personality doesn't change. In fact, there are instances where a monkey uh, was king of a colony, was operated upon. Following surgery, he was still king of the colony, and none of the monkeys could detect that he had been altered. This is a freshly split monkey. He's immediately accepted by his cage mate, and before long, they will be playing like uh, any girl and boy monkey should play. In spite of its normal behavior, radical changes have taken place in the mental processes of the split-brain monkey. 
To measure the changes, Dr. Sperry and his associates developed this elaborate testing device. It tests one half of the monkey's brain without involving the other half. Here, Dr. Gazaniga tests one hemisphere by making the animal retrieve food with its right hand, using only its sense of touch. Then he switches access to the food to the left hand and the other half of the brain, and we see that the left hand becomes as proficient as the right. Two tentative conclusions are possible. First, the two halves of the split brain can operate independently as though each were a single brain. Second, there is no transfer of information between the two hemispheres. Testing these conclusions further, he brings into play the monkey's sense of vision. He makes the animal peer through an eye hole at a response panel bearing two symbols. Using one eye and one of its half brains, it learns to press the triangle to receive a food pellet reward. The eye hole is switched and the monkey's other eye and half brain are introduced to the panel. It is now confused and makes many mistakes. The left brain, which knows how to do the trick, cannot pass its knowledge to the right brain. The test confirms the previous conclusions. In the split brain monkey, the two halves of the brain have separate memories and can perform independently. Do these conclusions apply to the human brain? To find out, two subjects were tested whose brains had been sectioned to relieve epilepsy. Test results show that speech is localized in only one half brain. Dr. Gazaniga now reconstructs the test. We must remember, though, that in this, the surgery on these two people, uh, their optic chiasm was not sectioned as it was in the monkey, f <coughs> because there was no reason to section it. Therefore, uh, what uh, these people, uh, when they look through one eye, visual information goes to both hemispheres. We can't have that in our specific testing situations. So by using this uh, gadget that we've made, we can prevent that. Uh, it's just true uh, that the anatomy of the human visual system allows so that when a person fixates on a central point, what one sees to the left of that point is projected to the right hemisphere, and what one sees to the right of that point is projected into the left hemisphere. So that uh, a split brain person can be sitting here, and when we flash on a picture, say an orange, into the right visual field, that information is only projected into the left hemisphere. And we found that the patient says, uh, that he describes it as an orange, and, and no matter what the stimuli, words, pictures, uh, they describe in a correct manner. A similar visual stimuli are flashed into the left visual field, which go to the right hemisphere, such as a uh, fork, like you see here. The patient will say, uh, when asked, uh, uh, we will, the experimental will ask, what did you see? And the, exper and the patient will say, I didn't see anything. And the experimental, the experimental will then say, well, uh, pick out the card that best describes what you may have seen. And sure enough, the patient uh, goes out very calmly and points to the word fork. So that uh, what happens in the split brain patient is that all the sensory information that is projected and, and, and arrives in the left hemisphere can be talked about. But all that information that arrives in the uh, right hemisphere is, is perceived and acted upon, but it is not talked about because the patient has no awareness of it in terms of his ability to verbally, audibly express it out loud. If speech originates in the left half of the brain, are there any functions special to the other half? Here, a split brain subject provides the answer. As he tries to copy this pattern with blocks, we discover his ability is confined to his right half brain. Now let's remember that the left hand is governed from the right hemisphere. And you will see that he has absolutely no problem in solving the problem. When the patient tries to solve the problem with his right hand, which is governed from the left hemisphere, we find that he is not capable of doing it. Namely that the right hand, which is governed from the left hemisphere, is intrinsically incapable of performing this kind of visual constructional tasks. 
It's interesting to note that the whole perspective is gone. He has three and one block combinations. It doesn't even square them up. But you can see the left hand wants to keep helping the right and, and, and is interfering. Well, we're now seeing that the left hand can perform the problem and that the right hand cannot. Now the question becomes, what happens when you allow both hands together to try to solve the problem? And what we find out is that they fight over each other. One hand knows how to do it and one hand does not. And so they more or less squabble. And the reason for this is that the, the hemispheres are disconnected. Now, the right hemisphere controls the left hand and the left hemisphere controls the right hand. And these are almost mutually independent systems. It was as if uh, two people were fighting over performing this task. One knew how and one didn't, and one would fight for dominance of the situation. What have we gained through this research into split brains? It is now possible to localize in one half brain basic mental processes like learning and memory. This cuts the complexities of brain research almost in half, so that in the future we can expect to achieve deeper insights into the mechanics of how the brain really works. National Educational Television Network.